John chapter 5, verse number 1. John chapter 5, verse number 1. This is the next miracle in, in our process as we're studying through the miracles of the book of John. And what a powerful, powerful lesson we have. John chapter 5, verse number 1 begins like this. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city, near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda and five covered porches. Now, I want you to understand that down by the gate, by the sheep gate, and you can still see that gate today, and we're going to go there, some of us, uh, in just a few months, and you're going to be able to see this, this pool and was able to be located because the, the, the place was given by the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches. Wow, I just had a revelation I've not had uh, as I was studying this. Some couldn't even see the waters troubled, and many couldn't get to the troubled waters. But watch what happens. There was one of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? Pretty simple question, right? Would you like to get well? Let me just ask you a question this morning. Do you want to be free? Do you want to overcome that obstacle that has been holding you back? Do you want those things that, that cause you to have to walk into this house with conviction to begin to uh, be taken control of and you winning the victory by the blood of Jesus Christ so that you can walk into this house rejoicing knowing that the God who brought you through the week is the God you've come to join with others to worship? Do you want that in your life? And it's that simple of a question. Jesus looks at this man who's looking for his miracle and says, Do you want to be well? And look at his response. I can't. Do you want to be well? I can't get well. There's no hope for me. He says, I can't, sir. I can not be well. The sick man said, this is why. He said, not only can I not get well, I can tell you why I can't get well. And I don't know why uh, this is happening at this point in the sermon, but I feel the Holy Spirit of God already rising up within me that there are people here who will say, I can't do this, and these are the reasons why. I can't walk in power. I'll never be free from that addiction. I'll never be free from that problem. I'll never be free from those struggles. And you tell yourselves why you can't get over that hurt from your childhood, why you can't recover from your divorce, why you can never love again, why these things can never happen, and you're so convinced in your mind that you can't, that you forget there's a God who's talking to you saying you can because of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we say, we can't, just like the sick man, because why? For I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Somebody gets the blessing ahead of me. Now, that's actually a lie, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Jesus told him, watch what Jesus says, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Not even nice at this point, you know, oh, your sins are forgiven. He says, get up. He says, you've convinced yourself that you are defeated. And Jesus looks at him, and I, it's almost like I can hear that voice of the Holy Spirit reverberating this morning as him saying, look, you've convinced yourself that you're done. You've convinced yourself you're out, but God sends a voice this morning that says, get up and be made whole. Rise and walk again and become what God's called you to be. Amen. I told you, you better, you better uh, pull out your amens this morning because I feel it today. Amen. And instantly the man was healed, and he rolled up his sleeping mat, and he began walking but this miracle happened on the Sabbath. Praise God. The miracle happened when they gathered to worship. I believe there are miracles in this house that can happen because we have gathered together with faith. Amen. Father God, I ask you for supernatural life change. Amen. How many believe that? Well, say it with me. God, we believe you. God, we believe your promises. Amen. Pastor Don, you're fired up. Well, I, I tell them not to let me hold the mic when I preach because I start preaching more like an evangelist when they do. Amen. Now listen. I believe there are people here today that you've come to accept, tolerate certain situations, problems, and weaknesses in your life because you think there's nothing more to do about it. 
Do you think that you fought it? So you, there's no reason fighting it anymore. You think that, it, that this problem has come to your life in such a way that there's no reason believing God anymore for him to move and deliver. But I want you to know there's hope in Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of a story of George Danzig. And George Danzig, uh, in 1939, he enrolled in a graduate study program in California, Berkeley. And as he enrolled in this program, he was studying statistics. And so he was under one of the most uh, famed professors. And this famed professor started off his class, and, and he wrote out two statistical problems that the world said were unsolvable. And he talked in the beginning introduction of his class how that, that some things just can't be solved. But the problem was George was late to class that day. And when George arrived in class, he saw two equations on the board, and so he copied them down as his homework assignment. George went to work on those homework assignments. He did not know that the professor's lecture was on why these can't be solved. All he knew was he needed to get them solved in order to get the grade. So George felt like his assignment was a little late. But George finally solved the world's unsolvable equation. He solved them, turned his paper in, and six weeks later, the professor knocked at his door, and George immediately began to apologize. He said, you know, I try to be a good student, and I'm so sorry that assignment was late. And the, the professor said, what do you mean the assignment was late? He said, that wasn't even an assignment. You, young man, have solved two unsolvable problems that every other person before you in history has said, this can't be done. So what was uh, George's response? He said, well, if someone had told me that they were unsolvable, I guess I probably would have never tried to solve them. He said, if somebody had told me that this is just the way it is, then I would have just left it that way. Somebody needs to get what I've come to bring you today, that we make far too many false assumptions about what is and what isn't possible. We have convinced ourselves that's just the way it is. But what we've really done is said nobody or nothing can do anything about this. I can't, you can't, and why not just believe that God can't? But you see, I've not been preaching that kind of a God to you lately. I've been preaching a God to you who the Bible says that he is Lord over every law of the universe. He made them. He commands them. The seas calmed at his word. The winds calmed down at his command. The earth moves at his very beckoning. And that kind of God looked death right in the eyes and woke up in power and walked out to say, if you will believe with me, all things are possible. Amen. But we believe the wrong. We believe the faults. George solved the unsolvable because he didn't know it couldn't be done. And therein is the secret into God changing your life. When you begin to believe the promise that there is nothing that is impossible with the Lord. Matthew 19, 26, Jesus said that. He said, with God, all things are possible. Why don't we just begin to declare that with God, all things are possible possible come on that's about half a half a stick of faith there i said with god all things are possible luke 137 it was said again nothing is impossible with god as believers the word impossible has no place belonging in our vocabulary because our god loves to specialize in waiting to the last second when you've got nothing left to hold on to of your own and when you finally say okay god i don't know how and i don't know why but i give up and he says i've been waiting on you to give up and get out of the way now rise up and walk in freedom because god moves for you amen I believe there are people here today, I believe there are people that are tuning in with us today who need to hear this message, that with God all things are possible. With God all things are possible. Somebody better help me get excited in this place because I'm about to have my own fit up here. Amen. With God all things are possible. You see, believing in the impossible keeps us from experiencing the God possible. When you have too much faith in the impossible, you are not able to see the, have faith in the God who makes all things possible. Let me give you a quote from a, not a very religious man, but Henry Ford. He said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Let that soak in for a moment. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Now, I'm not come to preach some mind over matter message to you. It's faith over matter. 
I remember back in the days when, when everybody was telling you if you received some kind of a diagnosis that you just didn't need to claim it. And people will say something. I'll come in somewhere and I'll be feeling bad. My eyes will be running. My nose will be stopped up. I'll say, well, excuse me, I'm a little sick. And they'll say to me, oh, pastor, don't claim sickness. And I'm almost, I almost want to go, how are you? Hey, man, don't <laughs> Excuse my terminology, but I am who I am. Amen. And I said, I just like, you know what? The truth is I am sick. But the, the greater truth is my God can still heal me. My God can still touch me. Amen. Praise God. I remember people saying, oh, don't claim it. Don't claim it. I remember a little joke I used to hear as a child. Somebody saying, well, if you just if it's name it and claim it, can you imagine when you get to hell, people down there going, this ain't hell and it ain't hot. This ain't hell and it ain't hot. I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter where well, you do in the flesh in that matter, but what we're making is a statement of faith. I'm not accepting something that is true as an untruth, but I'm accepting the greater truth over where I am, that my God is still able, my God is still faithful, and he can deliver me. Do you know why I'm fighting hell itself this morning to bring you this message? It's because hell does not want to give up. But when you approach hell with a word from God, knowing that God is greater than the bondages of the enemy, it has to let go. And if you will catch this, God wants to deliver you by the power of the Holy Ghost. But Pastor Don, you, you don't understand. I've already got the doctor's diagnosis. Not diagnosis. Well, that's all right. But it's time for you to start seeking for a second opinion. And it needs to be God's opinion, the great healer's opinion. Amen. I feel God. You see, we don't really know how or when, but at some point, this man began to believe the miracle uh, in the, or the message that said, "You will never walk again." Somebody told him, "You will never walk," and for almost four decades, it was true. Almost four decades. To put that in perspective for you, during the time of Christ, the average age of life expectancy was only 28. And the reason for that was the infant mortality rate was so high. If you managed to live past the age of two, you had the wonderful joy of knowing that you would live somewhere around 40 years as it crept around the 40-year mark. So here's a man who has been laying by a pool in a, in a state that nobody wants to be in, and he's been there for longer than almost anybody alive can remember. 38 years years he's been in this situation his prospects were settled if there was ever a hopeless case he was the poster child until the great physician walks up and he writes out a very simple prescription it's very simple get up pick up your mat and walk he walks up to him and says listen now your healing is before you get up and walk somebody needs to hear what I'm about to tell you God is not limited by how long or how bad your circumstance is. It's not over until God says it's over. If you want a second chance, it's time to start seeking that second opinion and get God's opinion over your life. I want you to know you need to keep seeking him. And I want to give you a very simple fact. Are you ready for this? God won't answer 100% of the prayers that you don't pray. I want you to get that. God won't answer 100% of the prayers that you don't pray. I believe that the eyes of the Lord, according to Scripture, are searching, th searching throughout the earth, looking for whom he may show himself strong for. I am not preaching some God to you that is bound up, wrapped up in the bonds of religion, and he can only move when you turn to some certain page and pray some certain prayer. But I'm looking for a God who shows up on the scene, and when he shows up on the scene, miracles begin to happen. I'm looking for a God who the Bible says that when Jesus came into the town, all their sick, I didn't say some of their sick, I said all their sick were made well i'm looking for an encounter with jesus christ that when he comes into this place like i feel him now that faith arises and people begin to claim that my god is able to meet my needs according to his riches and glory and we walk out of this place different than we came because we believe in a god who is able but the problem is most of us if we were in, 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 in like in major league sports, we would, we would be fired tomorrow. Could you imagine if a major league batter was, was told to go out to bat and he said, oh, I, I don't want to get in the batter's box because I struck out last time. I, I'm afraid. I, I've not been, been hitting it out of the ballpark every time. 
I've not been winning every time. I've not been, I've not been making connection every time. And so uh, if, if he were to do that, eventually they'd stop sending him out there. Probably wouldn't take long. But you, they have to understand that when you get out there, there's a time that you're going to make connection, and then there's times that you're trying to make connection. And, and the problem is in our faith, many of us treat our faith like that batter's box. We're like, I'm afraid to believe. I tried to believe, and, I, and nothing happened. I'm afraid to keep asking. I'm afraid to keep praying. I'm, I'm afraid to keep trusting God. But what you need to do is step back in the batter's box and say, I'm going to keep swinging for the fences. I'm going to keep believing God's going to bring me out of this. I'm going to keep trusting God. And when you finally make connection, whoo, you're going to run the bases with your hands in the air declaring, my God is faithful and my God is able. Amen. Oh, Pastor Don, you're just talking like this because you've got a direct line connection. I feel like my batting average is not as good as yours sometimes. Why? I bet you I'm praying with people a lot more than some of you are praying with people. Amen. I have laid hands on people expecting the miraculous to happen, and, and the miraculous didn't happen. I've laid on hands on people just hoping God would do something, and the supernatural power of God changed lives. If I could figure out the equation of that, that we would have lines out the doors, people wanting to be healed in this place. But here's what I do know. Just because one didn't receive doesn't mean I'm not going to ask for another. I'm going to keep asking. I'm going to keep knocking until heaven opens. We're going to keep swinging for the fences. Amen feel this today God wants you to realize that something has to change in you though to keep you moving forward and no matter how many times we feel like we have missed our moment we keep swinging for the fences we must keep believing in God who makes the impossible possible you see God works for people who don't let assumptions keep them from believing what would have happened if Joshua had assumed that, that God couldn't make the sun st stand still but Joshua assumed that God could. Elisha did not assume that iron could not float. God was able. Mary didn't say, whoa, 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 uh, virgins can't get pregnant. She said, let it be as unto me as the Lord has spoken. Peter did not say, Lord, I can't walk on the water. You know better than that. But instead, when God called, he assumed that God was greater than the promises or the plans of this world's uh, laws. When uh, Jesus looked at the grave, he did not assume that he couldn't beat death, but he knew that by the power of the Holy Spirit, he would come out of that grave. You see, we must realize that our assumptions, they try to hide the truth. What's the truth? You've got to realize God is able. Let me just declare it again. Some of you are going to help me. God is able. That's what you've got to learn. When the devil shows up, start saying, God is able. When the devil tells you, you don't understand, you're not going to survive this one. Instead of saying, oh, woe is me. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I should do next. You ought to start quoting the promises of God. God is able. See, some of you, it's just on the tip of your tongue, but you're still believing the lie. But I'm trying to give you hope that you begin to declare God is able. The next time it seems like hell falls in your home and you feel like giving up, look at your spouse and look at him and say, God is able. Amen. I'll tell you what that little lady would she'd say she'd say yeah you're right God's able to get a hold of you and I'll say he will just after he gets a hold of you amen glory to God look it's time for you to stop believing the lie. Some of you, every time you fight, the devil says, that's it. You're not going to be able to work it out. Your family's uh, up in spoke. It's time for you to stop believing the lie and start saying, devil, you don't understand. I got hold of a word, and I believe the promises of God. I've believed the lie long enough. God is able, and I'm going to walk in faith. Any other assumption other than God is able is a false assumption. He is the God who can make the impossible possible. Now, I'm going to step out on plank here because you need to know the truth. You're going to look at me funny for a moment, but how many of you, while I was reading that passage, you were following in your Bibles, you thought I missed a verse this morning? Anybody? Praise God. I see how many of you read along with me. Amen. If you have an older translation of the Scripture, uh, uh, the King James particularly, you're going to think I missed verse number 4. You're going to think that I skipped verse number 4. The verse that I'm talking about is the verse that says that it was at a certain time of year the angel descended out of, uh, from heaven and stirred the waters. And people would get in to get healed. Let me just tell you that uh, 
First off, historically, we have no evidence that anyone ever got healed in the waters. None in Jewish history. Zero. No evidence that that was the case. Let me just tell you, if people got healed that way in the waters, people would have been so packed around those waters, they would have never got out of them. They would have stayed in the waters. Those pools were fed by springs that would cause a bubbling. And a myth began to occur. Some of you are saying, are you calling the Word of God myth? Let me preach a moment more. A myth began to be reported that if you would get in the waters when it bubbled, that it was an angel and you'd be healed. And so the people believed the myth, and they were there looking for this myth. You say, Pastor Don, but this is in the Bible. Actually, in the original manuscripts of the book of John, verse number 4 was not there. That's why all of your modern translations exclude it from the Scriptures. They mark it out because the, book, uh, the verse number 4 did not appear in the Scriptures until 1100 A.D. So almost uh, 1,100 years later, just out of over 1,000 years later, that the book of John was written, they wrote that verse in as Scripture. Now, the closest evidence that we see where it first began was about 800 A.D., where someone wrote it as a commentary in the side note. And somewhere, the Catholic Church decided that it was going to move that from a commentary into the Scripture. And when King James translated the Bible, he used those copies from the 1100 A.D. Uh, 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 stuff from the church, and they took that verse of a myth and put it in the Bible as Scripture. No one ever healed that way. No one ever healed, but what had happened was the people had begun to believe a myth. And for 38 years, this man had reserved a spot near the pool. People would swim all around him, and most of them simply ignored him. But he kept his eyes on the water. He kept that spot because ever so often those pools would cause it to bubble, and, 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 and he was desperately looking for a miracle, but he was looking in the wrong place. Imagine the scene for a moment when the waters would bubble and, and a mass of, uh, 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 of people would begin to claw their way toward the water and someone would jump in. More than likely, somebody was actually already in the water because of what it was used for. But the true tragedy here was that as they would go into action, they were believing a myth. They were believing a superstition. They were believing that there was something that they could connect to and control that would make uh, uh, their miracle happen. Now, that seems silly to us, doesn't it? But how many of you know somebody's got a lucky pair of socks? How many know somebody that, that, that plays the lottery on their birthday? Don't, don't say amen to that one. How many know somebody who uh, stays home or doesn't make plans on Friday the 13th? But you see... The superstitions actually begin to not invoke the supernatural, but they begin to keep us from encountering the supernatural. Oh, Pastor Don, I, I don't have any uh, superstitions. Let me just deal with that religious devil for just a moment. We begin to tell ourselves, if I'm good enough this week, I might feel God. We begin to say, maybe if I give enough, God might care more about me. We begin to talk about putting the right apparel on and the fish on the back of our car. And just maybe God will be riding with us. And we have all of these supernatural things. When you go to Third World Nations, you'll see, Jimmy will tell you this, they, they literally write things about God all over their cars. And so they'll have a car come at you that you think's a believer car and it'll say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all over it. And the guy will lean out the window and cuss you out. Amen. Why? Because he believes that he can control the atmosphere around him in a natural sense. But he, what he doesn't understand is God's not looking to move in a natural sense. He wants to move in a supernatural way in your life. Amen. When you put your faith in your ability, your faith is in your ability. But nothing less than total reliance on God and God alone will bring the miraculous hand of God into your life. You see, the opposite of belief isn't just unbelief, it's false belief. The greatest handicap this man faced wasn't physical, it was mental. It was in his mind. He was believing for something false. He was believing, God, if you'll just do this. Now, I know no one in here has ever dealt with anything like that. I know we've never said, no, God, I need you. When you do this, I'll, I, know that, I know you'll be able to deliver me. I want you to know 
I have given more gratitude for unanswered prayers than I have answered prayers. I have looked back at things I asked God for, and when I finally got where God wanted me to go, I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you didn't give me what I wanted. Amen. I praise God. It could be as simple as when we first got married. I don't know how many times we went down to the car lot and prayed, God, is this your will for us? And what? we saw what those payments would be, and we saw what that would be. And Lord, is this your will for us? And by the grace of God, so many times we weren't given the loan. We were newlyweds. We weren't given the loan. And, and I would leave away from there feeling so defeated, so defeated. But I got to thinking a little bit more about that, particularly when God finally, I'll never forget, we'd been looking for a car. And they kept, here was the thing, they kept telling us, you've got to have a co-signer to get a car. You've got to have a co-signer to get a car. You, you know, you don't have enough credit. And I, I really believe that Scripture uh, teaches against going in debt, but if it it does it particularly talks about not using co-signers not signing for somebody else's debt and so I said well that's gonna be a sign to us if, if they don't give it to us and I was driving our, our young people from this church down the road and I saw a, a vehicle on the side of the road at a car lot and I said I said Lord I sure would like to have that car and the Lord just birthed my spirit you can have that car we went back to that car lot and they said you can have that car we drove that car home but the problem was just a few days after we started driving that car it was beautiful it was awesome but this little some of you won't know what this is but back in the days this little book about this big came in the mail and it had 60 payments in it how I many you know what I'm talking about amen and it had all these payments in there and, and, and I remember looking at those payments and I remember comparing the size of that payment to the ones that uh, uh, we had wanted the things that we thought we were gonna get and I remember remember saying thank you God for how you protected me because this is hard enough sometimes we we need to realize God's working for our good God's protecting us God's taking care of us but as God's taking care of us we lose sight of the fact that we sometimes get in the way of what God's doing but God's looking for people who in the middle of their storm will stop trying to rationalize it all away and start realizing God I cannot deliver myself I can't bring this miracle. I can't do this because the greatest obstacle to your miracle is the plan that you've laid out for how it has to be solved. Let me show you how some of those prayers work. This is not the way I preached this in the last service. Let me just show you how these prayers work. Ready? God, change my spouse. Come on now. You better repent and start saying, God, change me, change me, change me. Lord, I want this. I want that. Do this. How about saying, God, I don't know how you're going to get me out of this, but I know you can. Pastor God, uh, God's not answering my, my prayers. Yes, he's working on your good side. And if your prayers take you to the wrong side, then God's seemingly working against you, but he's lining you up for blessings. I want to tell you, God's good. But this man's problem was he was longing after the wrong thing in the wrong place. He thought what he needed was to be first down in the water. And we keep trying what isn't working. When all the while, the God who can do the impossible is beckoning on our faith. Just believe it. Just believe it. Somebody will come and play something today. I mean, if you want God to do a new thing, you can't keep doing the same old thing. Oh, I'll never forget. I had somebody that was hurting me deeply. Oh, I, I mean, it was, it was tough. I was trying to grip my teeth and be nice and smile and do all the things God says. You know, sometimes we, as religious people, we struggle. We'll quote a scripture like this. The Bible says when you do good unto your neighbor that despitefully uses you that God himself will pour out heaping coals of fire on their head. I don't know how many times I was like, burn their brains out, Jesus. Burn their brains out, Jesus. But I had been praying, God, get a hold of them. Shake them, God. Deal with their sin. Deal with their sin. Deal with their sin. Deal with their sin. And the Holy Spirit finally spoke to me. He said, you pray, I'll bless them. For almost two years, I'd been crying out to God, deal with it, deal with it, deal with it, deal with it. And God said, you pray, I'll bless them. And I was like, I don't want them blessed. Just straight up with you. He said, you pray, I'll bless them. I started praying, bless them, bless them, 
Bless them on every side. Let your blessings chase them. When I started lining up with the will of God, it was not one month's time. They were somewhere right in here giving their life to God. Everything was straightening out in their life, and it worked out in my life. Why? Some of us have been praying the same prayer. God, I... I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. It's time to change the prayer, folks. You can, you can, you can, you can. You don't understand what I've been through. You are, you are making that whatever you went through bigger than who he is. And I guarantee you, he's already been through worse, and he can bring you through because he's able to come through. Amen. unlearn every assumption that you've ever made save one very simple God is able but you don't understand erase it but erase it what is our prayer God is able stand with Wherein is our hope? With God, nothing is impossible. I, I don't know why this story has reverberated in my heart today, and I, I've shared it so many times, and many of you are so sick of it. But I'll never forget, I was in Hyderabad or Vijayawada, India. And I was sitting there in that Bible college wondering why I was there, they were having me interview the potential pastors that wanted to enter the Bible college. Okay? So they're telling me their stories, and the young man came up, and he said, this is my story. I told you this, but just so quickly, so you, I feel led. This has been in my heart today. He said, Pastor, I was cleaning my gun at my sentry post up in the Himalayas, looking between Pakistan and India. My gun discharged, and my partner at the century was killed instantly he said I was arrested and charged with murder sentenced to life without the possibility of parole and thrown into one of the worst prisons for the military in our nation he said my life is over he said I began to pray to the thousands of gods that I had heard of in the Hindu worship he said my life didn't change everything stayed the same he said, but one day I remembered somebody telling me about a God by the name of Jesus. He said, I bowed before him and I prayed this simple prayer. He said, Jesus, if you are God, deliver me from this situation and I will spend the rest of my life telling people that you are the one true God. See, God's looking for somebody this morning that you feel like you're facing a life sentence and you need to pray that kind of prayer. God, if you're able, deliver me. He prayed that prayer. They came to his door. They opened his door and said, you are free to go. He said, Pastor, I need to know how to say what I'm supposed to say. I thought, well, you've got a pretty good testimony already <laughs> that God is able. I've come to tell you that no matter what your sentence is, Some of you go, I'm not guilty of a crime. No, you've been sentenced somehow. Somebody may have abused you. There are people listening to me or watching or here present today that maybe somewhat brutally attacked you sexually and you feel like that put a sentence of fear and defeat into your life that you don't know how to get past. Let me tell you something. My God is able. Somebody, you've been told lies your whole life one right after another and, and, and you don't feel like you can ever trust anybody ever again let me tell you something there is one who will never let you down who is trustworthy because he is able his name is Jesus he wants to change your sentence Pastor Don, I could never get involved in the things of God before I got hurt. My God is able. Pastor Don, you don't understand my sickness. My God is able. You don't understand the extent of what I've been through. My God is able. My God is able. Let me make it clear. My God is able. Father God, we lift our hands to a God who is able. 
We declare it today. Come on, declare it with me. We declare you're able and you're faithful. I want somebody, if, if, you, if you can't do it on your own, do it with me. God, I declare you're able. God, I declare you're able. You're faithful. You are greater than every problem. You are greater than every struggle. You are greater. Somebody carried a problem in here this morning. You've carried in the church for years. I declare over you that if you'll surrender to God, God wants you to know right now he's able to, to destroy the bondage. He's able to deliver you. He's able to set you free. But Pastor Don, I, I don't expect it to happen in an instant. Well, God, I'm talking talking about wants to do that in an instant right now in somebody's life now's your moment whisper it with me declare it with me shout it with me i don't care god is able father i thank you for your faithfulness we have looked to man false assumption we have done the same thing for year after year false assumption but jesus is among us who says get well be better be healed be delivered be set free and now we rise in faith. See, that's how you get up in faith. You see, the opposite of unbelief. Our belief is not unbelief, it's false belief. You believe the wrong lie for too long, it's time to believe the truth from now on. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Nobody looking around. The devil's been on somebody this week. You know exactly who you are. I don't even tell you what I'm talking about right now, but you know exactly who you are because God's dealing with your heart. Let me see your hand if that's you. Wow. Wow. I declare God is able. I declare God is able. Don't, don't stay out of the batting box. Step up right now. Grab your bat and get ready to hit a home run in faith. Devil, you're not holding us out anymore. You're not keeping us back anymore. You can put those hands down for just a moment. I don't know why I feel this. I, I was about to go in our salvation call for today. But if, if, would you, if you feel comfortable, just reach out and put your hand on the, maybe the shoulder or if you need to take hands, whatever it is, or the person next to you. Father God, I pray for supernatural connection to begin to happen right now. Father, I pray for the anointing of the Lord to begin to, to move among these connections. God, I declare there's somebody here that was wondering today how, it, how that financial need's going to be met. God, it's, it, it is literally coming for them. Lord, it may come in the mail. Lord, I, I believe they're going to they're gonna receive some kind of notification, God, that you, Lord, are moving for them. There's going to be a testimony. It came in the mail for me. It, I'm reminded of God when it came in the mail for us. It's coming in the mail. My God is able. My God is able. That call they've been waiting for is going to come. Well, I pray for that, 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 that family member that's lost out there. And there's someone wondering where they are. God, I pray that, that, that you're going to bring them clarity. And they're going to know that they're going to be located, Father. Jesus. Jesus. Father, we ask you now in your name. With everyone still praying, if you're here today and you say, Pastor Don, before I can trust God with my situation, I need to trust him with my life. And I've not been faithfully serving God. And today I want to know him with all my heart and all my soul. If that's the case today, if that's you, you say, I want to surrender my life completely to Jesus Christ. If that's you, I'm looking all over this building. Would you just put your hand up? I'm not going to embarrass you any more than the ones I just had raised their hands. But if that's you, hold it up high where I can see it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking around to my right. Are there others? Hallelujah. Hold it up high. Hold it up high. God is able. God is able. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right, pray, let's pray this prayer. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised Christ from the dead, we would be born again. We're going to pray a prayer with you. God's going to change your life forever, right now, forever in Jesus' name. Let's pray this prayer together. Jesus, by faith, I believe your promises. And in Jesus' name, Father, forgive me. God, I have sinned. You see my past, my present, and my future. My Father in heaven, forgive me of my sins. And in Jesus' name, I believe by faith as I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He came for me. He died for me. He arose for me. By faith, now, my life is changing. God, I give you everything. By faith, now God is my Father. 
Heaven is my home. This matter is settled. Amen and amen. Would you give the Lord a mighty praise today?